Welcome to the Healthy Human Revolution podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I'm so honored and excited to, to welcome Audrey Sanchez from Balance.org. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. So, you know, you have an amazing mission, and I think I can never quite do justice with people with a, you know, canned intro or whatever, but can you tell us a little bit just about what Balanced is, and then I'd really like to go into your personal story of how you even got the idea that you wanted to literally take lead and help us, you know, build a better food system. Absolutely. So uh, Balanced is a public health and nutrition advocacy organization. We help anybody, anywhere, advocate for healthier menus in community institutions where they live. So schools, hospitals, offices, universities. Um, we have created all the tools and resources to help people make change in the food system that is most important to them. Wow. So tell us a little bit about how you became interested in taking on such a, yeah. a very large uh, challenge. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty interesting story. My history is actually as an educator. So I spent about a decade working in schools, first as a teacher, and then training teachers, and then training school leaders, all in um, Kansas City, where I live, in New Orleans, so post-Katrina New Orleans. The school system is quite interesting. Um, but then I had my daughter, and a whole lot of things started to fall into place, um, where suddenly the world was much bigger, and um, I wanted to make that big world better for her. And then also for all of the students that I had grown to know and love over the decade before that. So this work is really rooted in children and families and knowing that children now are developing the diseases that will impact them in a few decades. I think we think a lot about um, lifestyle medicine and treating people's diet related disease when they're older, but this starts now. And um, it's really important for me to fix that. You speak like a mother from my own heart. I mean, <laughs> have three grown children and um, you know, I didn't truly appreciate the value of nutrition until mm. I really discovered, even as a physician, you go to medical school, they teach you you know, well, you have low vitamin D, you can get this, right. or if you have this, you do that. So you look at, you know, deficits in your diet, but they never look at what can I give you to thrive yes. and reverse disease or prevention, prevention being here, the key. Sure. So I think that's amazing. So how did you, you know, there's so many ways we can make the world a better place for our kids. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you choose food? Was there a specific calling to that? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if I would call it a calling or being able to see the need. No one else was doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is such a complex, like systemic problem to realize, to look around, to have no one else approaching it to fix it at the systems level. I thought this is important to me and I want to have the biggest impact possible. That's where I belong. Wow, that's awesome. So then you d decided to dive in and found Balanced. Yes. Um, can you share with us how did that idea come trickling up to the mind and then you decided and took the courage to actually, you know, take this full on because you're really, you know, blazing trails that not too many people have been down. Yeah. So um, one of the things that has always sort of outraged me is this idea that, um, we blame individual consumers for um, the consequences of a system that is built against us already or mm. um, that has different priorities than our health. And when I started thinking about this problem, I realized there are lots of folks doing really excellent education work and people all around me want to eat better. They want to have higher, they want to have better nutrition. But that is impossible in a system that does not facilitate that. And that is especially difficult for the children and families that I knew uh, in low income communities across the country. And so balance was built to address the upstream problem so that as consumers downstream 
the desire to make this change, it's at, just at the very least possible. <laughs> because right now, it's just not possible for a lot of people. Right, absolutely. So when you mentioned that you saw challenges for those, you know, post-Katrina, um, for those who don't remember, that's the hurricane that came. I was actually in residency when that happened. We had a thousand people when I was in Texas actually come and there were just so many challenges, just, you know, people are displaced, they are losing medications, they're just, I mean, what a, a terrible impact it had on that society. Yeah. But can you tell us what you were seeing? Like, what type of challenges did you see? And it's almost like a post-apocalyptic type of yeah. setting almost, really. Yeah. Fortunately, I arrived just a, a couple years after, but ah. it still, it had not been entirely rebuilt. Um, that took about the greater part of the last decade. Um, but... What I see there is what I see in a lot of places, which is um, first, accessibility is a huge issue. So um, for a long time, we called them food deserts, but I have recently started changing my language to food apartheid because mm -hmm. they're actually systems that are designed to be um, more profitable and less uh, beneficial for people. It is an actual oppressive system. Um, and so just getting to a store that has fresh produce uh, is the number one challenge. Number two challenge is affordability. Um, it is when fresh produce is difficult to get to, it is also likely that it is expensive relative to other foods that you could find in your community. Um, that's a really big challenge. Um, and then just awareness and education. So if you have never had access to healthy food, you actually don't know how good it feels. And you just assume that this is what it feels like to eat. This is what it feels like to live. Um, and as such, you never sort of develop the uh, understanding of how to use food to nourish yourself. Mm. That's a really good point because even those who have access to good food or can afford it, I found that because of convenience and the way they were grew up, their the community, the society is just normal. Everyone, you know, walks around and drives through to the junk food, the fast food. That they that awareness of actually there's a life that without disease, which is normal, right? Yes. We, we can't quite understand the fact that it's not normal to be sick, people. Right. So that's you know, it's such a shock to my patients when I'm just suggesting to them that they can live a life if they literally just changed a little bit, you know, put what's on the end of their fork, they could get off of, you know, the majority, if not all their medications and live a life that's thriving and not one that's suffering. And it, yeah. they're just blown away that someone would actually speak to them that that's possible. You right, know? right. Yes, we have become so desensitized to disease because mm -hmm. we look around, everybody we know, every single person in our life is affected in some way likely directly, but even if not directly, uh, in close proximity, their parent, their spouse, their child, like we have just normalized the idea that we feel bad or that it is inevitable we'll have cancer or heart disease or, you know, Diabetes. Thing, diabetes yes, we'll die young. Right. Exactly. It, that to me is shocking. You know, it's funny because when I speak to my patients, I'm, many have diabetes and I get sent a lot of diabetic patients. And what's interesting is many of them say, well, my mom and dad had diabetes. So of course I have diabetes. I said, right. no, let's talk about that. You actually inherited their lifestyle, yes. which gave you the, you know, in the diabetes. Um, yes. Yeah. You might be a little more genetically prone, but you don't have to be a diabetic or at least a type two diabetic. And so mm -hmm. really fascinating information when you speak to people. So I would love, that's really fascinating that the food apartheid, how do, how do people react? Because that can be a very, I guess, a very um, challenging word. It's a very emotionally, sure. you know, when you think about apartheid, you're thinking South Africa and racial sure. relations, and that's a very emotionally charged word. So what type of responses do you get? Do most people go like, oh, wow, I never really yeah. realized that, or what's going on there? Yeah, great question. So I want to give credit to Karen Washington. She is a food justice uh, leader in this movement who created or who has the origin of that word comes from her. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, in general, as a nutrition advocate, I say a lot of shocking things or things that shouldn't be shocking, but are very shocking to people who have never considered the ways that our systems are structured to literally disregard our health in pursuit of corporate profit. 
Um, it sounds, a lot of things sound <laughs> very conspiracy, like conspiracy theory. Um, but when you dig in and you look at the history of our food system and you look at the history of our food industry and you look at the history of diet related disease that tracks along those changes, people become really, they share the outrage that I share once we're, once I'm able to help them understand more of how we got to where we are. Can you give us a brief synopsis of what you mean by, you know, our food industry history? Like what type of the, you know, what were the big movements or things that happened that you like to highlight with people when you actually explain that? Yeah, sure. Um, so our food system has not always looked like it looks now. We take that for granted. Um, roughly a hundred years ago is when we started to see the industrialization of food. So we started to see more mass produced food type products because it's not even full nourishing what we would consider like whole food. Um, and we started to see a real ramp up of the, the industrialization process and the processing of goods around 1950, 1960, coupled with the rise of uh, the ability to target and advertise and market to children and families. So at the same time that you could create an audience for a product, or at the same time that we had the technology to create a product, we also now have new capa had capabilities to target and market that product. As such, we started to see shifts from um, whole food being prepared to convenience products, there's also uh, the element of um, women in joining the workforce. So convenience became uh, increasingly necessary. As a mom, I 100% get that. Um, but what happened was the exploitation of that cult cultural shift by companies like, um, you know what, I won't name them so you don't get sued, but <laughs> by major food companies um, who then simultaneously uh, were either acquired by or partnered with Big Tobacco mm -hmm. to tap into those marketing strategies and tactics that happened around the late 70s, early 80s. And what we saw as a result of that is just this proliferation of um, food products, uh, pushing back against any sort of regulation and um, essentially creating the narrative that consumers are responsible for all of this happening mm -hmm. and they deserve what they get health wise. Um, nobody's forcing them to eat this, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so, so they're stepping outside of the responsibility. There's no social responsibility because they're just giving a product that people want. Right. Despite the fact that that product didn't exist 50 years ago and no one would have said, oh, I, you know what I really want? Cheetos. Like it would have been inconceivable. Or the Doritos and the millions of dollars of scientists that they hired yes. to actually yes. create it to where you want, you can't just have one. <laughs> yes, that bliss point. Yes, it oh, is an ab yes. absolute exploitation of um, <laughs> the modern human experience. Can you talk a little bit, because that's really interesting, because I, I, this, this gets a little bit to the science of food manufacturing. Can you talk a little bit to the bliss point and all of those things, yeah. the mouthfeel, things that they focus on. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, you know, they're hijacking our brain, but go ahead. I'll let you. Explain. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they would say that. Um, for any of your listeners who are interested in a deeper dive into this, the book um, Salt, Fat, Sugar by Michael Moss is an exceptional read. Yep. Um, but yeah, so food manufacturers create products to. Uh, they create products as closely as they can to what we have identified as the bliss point. So the bliss point is that exact spot of either salty or sugary or fatty that um, lights up all the good parts of our brain. It feels good. It tastes good. And it makes us want to eat more. So there is a point beyond the bliss point where consumers will be like, I actually can't eat very much of this. And there's a point below it where consumers say, I don't want to eat very much of this, but mm. somewhere between I can't eat it and I don't want to is that bliss point. Mm. And it is um, created by food scientists in a lab and tested um, with consumers, essentially like whichever of the products along a continuum of that don't want to eat it and can't eat anymore uh, hits the bliss point for the most people they manufacture and push out into the food industry. So um, 
there is also a book by this woman named Michelle Simon called Appetite for Profit that talks about the, um, the food type product and the process that um, over the past hundred years, the manufacturing process and the scientific process that resulted in that. So instead of saying like, this is a food, if we start referring to it as what it really is, which is a food type product that has flavors and sensations that you could never replicate in nature, like these flavors do not exist outside of combining chemicals in a lab. Um, and so we have gotten accustomed to calling it food, but it is really a food type product because it could not exist outside of the um, artificial creation of it. Franken foods. Yeah, Franken foods. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm curious, just going back a little bit in your history, have you always been like focused on your own healthy eating or was there an evolution to that or I'm curious there. Yeah. So um, the answer is yes and no. Uh, no better, do better situation. Um, mm -hmm. In high school, for reasons other than health, I uh, decided to be a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a town of 1500 in the middle of Kansas, two blocks from the sale barn. So I could just hear cows bellowing all night, all the time. Um, and so my initial foray into uh, plant-based eating was for ethical reasons. Um, but you can still feel very bad eating vegetarian or vegan if it's not healthy. Um, and again, just the, the inspiration of having a child, we talk about all of the like changes that have, that has for your emotional self and how you see the world. But really to me, I felt this recommitment, like, oh, I have to be here. I have to do this right. I have to model this for my child. And so that's when I really started to place heavy emphasis on nutrition. That's fantastic. Because a lot of parents, even though, you know, they will do anything for their children, nutrition is not at the forefront of, sure. because it, it's just not been brought to our consciousness, right? We're just, we're just sitting there going, we're feeding our children calories. They're not malnourished in the sense of a calorie deficit, but right. they are malnourished in the sense of nu nutrients. And yes. now we're, we're reaping those you know, rewards by having ill children and ADD and autism yeah. and food allergies and obesity, early diabetes. I mean, all of these things go together. Yeah. Um, really interesting stuff. I mean, I'm going to have to get that book, Appetite for Profit. I mean, that sounds yeah. really fascinating. I've already read the other one, but um, okay. Wow. Okay. So why... Because you know this, why is our healthy food so expensive? Can you explain that to the average person? Yeah, so it's a combination of a few things. Um, I can speak to it at the institutional level mostly. So why does the most unhealthy food end up in our schools, hospitals, pushed out by big food, food service companies? Um, and it, it, to a large degree, impacts you know, when we have more autonomy in the grocery store or restaurant. Um, there, along the same lines as the mass production of food type products, there has been a push to uh, mass produce uh, animal products in a way that then creates subsidies for specific types of food. And so when there's subsidy for grains that are used to feed animals, it lowers the price of having to, or it lowers the price of animal products, it lowers the price of the corn that then gets put into just corn syrup, junk food all over the place. Mm. Um, and so if we look at it at the highest level, there is a uh, major prioritization to subsidize foods that either can be used in the industrial food type process, process or to create um, less expensive animal products en masse. Mm. Um, and so the subsidi subsidies at the government level do not make it down to the um, fruits, vegetables, that sort of stuff. Uh, so why is that? Why was there a push for these animal products and these subsidies? Sure. I mean, is this a, a lobbying effort on, yeah. you know, big beef and big dairy type thing or what's yeah. going on? Yeah. At, at this point, it's a lobbying thing. Um, mm -hmm. There is a lot of power and money in that industry. Originally, the push for um, the industrialization of um, farmed animals was that we had the ability to. So suddenly we could, there were resources 
people had the means to um, purchase that. We had infrastructure that allowed transportation for more of these products in a way that traditionally we would have just had to find a farmer in our community, purchase animal product from that person, grow it ourselves. Um, so a whole lot of systems came together at sort of this tipping point at the, in the early 1900s that allowed for us to just create a whole bunch of very inexpensive, calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods um, that we now say are like just what people eat. Or like, my kid will only eat that. I will only eat this. Um, yeah, so it's a, res it's a result of a whole bunch of systems. And that's interesting because I, I kind of want to pull up the point that you said, oh, my kid will only eat this or sure. only, I'll only eat that. So this is something that I hear on a regular basis, yeah. right? So, you know, I may have someone because, of course, you and I are advocates of a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah. And so when I really speak to parents who are taking that on, like a mom, let's say, and she has children mm -hmm. at home or even a dad, and they're like, yes, I'm going to do this whole food plant-based diet, but I can't get my kids on board. It's like, oh, so I'm thinking teenagers, older kids, right? Ones that have access and are freely mobile if they drive. No, they're like three, five, seven, yes. nine years old. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I was like, yeah. so you're the parent, right? You, you do live with the children and bring home the food. They're like, yeah, but they won't eat anything else. I said, oh, okay, we got to sit back. And we have to understand that you have to parent. And yes. I think that's where you, that's the other cultural shift, right? Is that we've turned into, to be careful with what I say. I would say we've turned into parents who don't want to take responsibility for sure. those type of behaviors or blame mm -hmm. ourselves. I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm sure. just saying you're the responsible for what comes in home. Will they throw a fit? Yes. Yes, they will because you've created little monsters who love this food. But right. guess what? When there's nothing else, they'll, they'll eventually eat. They won't starve to death yes. and they'll be better for it. And so it's just really interesting how the parent has stepped out of the role of actually controlling what goes into their child's mouth. Yeah. And that's what I love about your organization is that you're telling parents to go not only beyond their own home, but we're going to go push it to the institution, yes. the school, the hospitals, these places where it should just be a no brainer that we want healthy food to nourish our children, but because of government subsidies and government interests in, you know, big industry that yeah. we're paying the price when they're, you know, their pockets are being aligned. And, Absolutely. um, geez, Louise. <laughs> yeah. I hear that a lot. Um, I was, I was actually talking to a woman the other day and she was like, when parents say that to me, I say, well, you make them brush their teeth. Right. And this is like, equally or more important. Like you, you make your children do stuff all the time. Why is making them eat healthy such a strange concept? <laughs> yeah, like I make my kid go to bed at eight o'clock. I make right. her brush her teeth. I make her wear shoes when we go in public. There are a lot of things that as parents, we don't think of as being, you know, bad to make them do. I think the point here is that it's, it's, it's uh, culturally expected right. that your children brush their teeth, that they wear shoes. That, mm. So these are the easy, they're expected because you would be a bad parent if you didn't. If your child's walking around barefoot, you know, that's an issue. But if your, your kid's, you know, drinking sodas and Cheetos in the doctor's office, which I've had patients <gasps> coming in for a refill of their ADD medications, and, you know, <laughs> like going, what am I, am I in the twilight zone? So, yes. you know, but that, that yes. is not necessarily pushed culturally. So it's an easy out. So you're always looking for the mm. least resistance in your day. The last thing you want to do is pick another battle with a kid. If you're not, if you don't understand the educational part. And I think that's where it's so important physicians, we have mm -hmm. to take the time to educate and advocate that they feed their kids healthy because people will listen to us. There's still, you know, some respect for physicians in their, in their advice. And, you know, the studies do show that Patients will act on advice, especially if the, the, the actual physician is walking the talk. So that's even more reason for us to be healthy ourselves. So yeah. fascinating. The psychology is, I could talk yeah. hours. So, at, the, <laughs> at the institutional level too, I hear it all the time. Like um, mm. food service directors at a school, well, kids won't eat that or it ends up in the trash. And all, but all they eat at home is junk. Right. And it's like, okay, if we know all they're eating at home is junk, then shouldn't this be the healthiest meal of their day? Absolutely. If we know that, you know, it's not something that can happen 
outside of school, but we have the responsibility and opportunity, like, sure, you're going to get pushback, but what a great opportunity to teach kids that food is food. <laughs> like, this is what it can be. But that's where we should take lessons from marketers, right? Yeah. So I have an MBA, so I love marketing. I think it's just fascinating how I can, you know, spend 30 seconds with you and tell you to, you know, you could go and buy a $10,000 car or something like right. that. So when they, you know, they do, I'm sure you're aware of the research that when they put even just a simple cartoon character yep. near a salad bar, they're, the increase is like 30 to 40% of that food consumption. These are simple fixes sure. or bring in nutritional classes, a, a school garden. There's so many ways to bring kids involved in that food decision that they'll want to eat the food. So these are just excuses, um, yes. which, you know, yep. it's, <laughs> again, wow. I'm, I'm just so amazed that you're doing all of this is great. Um, but I really like the, the other word you mentioned, disease desensitization. Desen yes. We're desensitized if, yes. to disease. There you go. <laughs> Can't speak today, apparently. Um, that is really intriguing. I'm going to start using some of these phrases because um, I use a lot of, you know, when we talk about food deserts and mm -hmm. when I'm speaking to patients about their resources and their community resources and the costs and the different mm -hmm. things. So now let's get to... What can the individual do? Because you do have sure. amazing resources. Can you just kind of walk us through when you decided to start Balance? What was your first most important step? Like you knew that it had to be in the hands of the everyday consumer who wanted to make yeah. a change. Yep. Well, as a mom, here's what I, here's what I know. If it's not easy, it won't happen. Um, and it's just true. Like I have so much happening on in my own life that if I'm taking on advocacy for my community, it has to be easy and it has to be something that I have uh, support and faith in. And so essentially what we did was we took just regular traditional campaign tactics, which sort of, uh, they're not a secret, you know, do some research, find a key decision maker, ask nicely. If they say no, ask a little bit more aggressively. If they say no, get a whole bunch of people to ask nicely. If they say no, get a whole bunch of people to ask aggressively, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> mobilize media, get the word out. Um, I think people would be really, really surprised by the power that they have. Mm. Um, and they would be really surprised by how little pressure you have to apply to someone else or an institution to get change to happen. Mm. Um, and it doesn't have to be bad pressure. It can just be, you know, 10 moms showing up saying, hey, we would like to see this change happen. In order to avoid any conflict, they'll make that change happen. Win-win. Mm -hmm. um, right. But yeah, it, it has to be easy. So we, you know, took those campaign tactics and um, we designed everything anybody would need, every single step along that continuum. Um, and so when people are ready to make that change happen in their community. We have an expert advocacy team available uh, in an unlimited capacity for as long as you need them to design and uh, adjust individual campaigns. So they are there for when you hear no the first time, <laughs> what do you do next? Uh, we, you know, we've created the flyers, we've created the posters, we've created the petitions on the websites. Literally all people have to do is want this. So if they have the enthusiasm, we have the expertise. That's amazing. So can you walk us through some examples of someone who's used your, you know, toolkits and sure. your coaches that you have available to help and what were the results? Yeah. So generally the people who come to us have ha, come to us have very, very uh, big dreams of, you know, having whole food plant-based items on the menu every single day. And we say, yes, but let's start uh, with something that we can probably make happen a lot faster. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we have parents, and this is an example from multiple school districts, but we have parents who will come to us and um, say, we want to make this happen. All my kid can eat is this like packaged peanut butter and jelly and it's cold and they want a warm meal at lunch and also all these other kids deserve this. So um, we help them ask for a 20% reduction in the least healthy menu items. Um, or the most overserved menu item. So, for example, chicken nuggets fits into that a lot. Um, there is really no need to have chicken nuggets on the menu every single day. 
um, or three times a week. So if you're worried that kids will revolt because you, you know, are taking away chicken nuggets, good news, they're still there two days a week. But let's replace that with a uh, plant-based alternative. And our goal is minimally processed from scratch if possible. If not, then we work with vendors who already supply things like low sodium bean burritos, that mm. sort of stuff. So we can help the food service director also get the tools. Um, and so we have that as the advocacy uh, level. We also have an institutional outreach level so or program. Uh, we have an expert on staff who can go to that key decision maker at a school and say, hey, all these parents are saying they want this. I can help you redesign your menu. And we will look at their menu and redesign it from scratch with them and then help them figure out where they're going to procure those goods. Wow. So have you found that the institutions are welcoming of these type of yeah, no, not usually. <laughs> I was going to say, wow, you're, you're changing the <laughs> status quo. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're really resistant, surprisingly. Um, it, is, it is shocking the degree to which people will dig into what they're doing. Um, oh. And no amount of saying you're poisoning children will change that. It's really surprising. Um, <laughs> But the more support that we provide them, the more likely they are to do it, which is why we have sort of the bottom up and top down pressure, but also solutions oriented programs. Um, a lot of food service directors who are open to it don't know how. They like don't know how to make that change and still fit within the FNS guidelines um, mm -hmm. because the menus that they've been using for years already fit those guidelines. So why change them? Can you explain what FNS is? Just for oh, them? yeah. Food Nutrition Services uh, or Standards uh, Guidelines. So it's the USDA telling schools if they want to be reimbursed for the meals that they're serving, they have to have X number of calories, X amount of fat, uh, saturated fat has to be below this level, and they have to have a serving of fruit, serving a vegetable, a meat or meat alternative entree, and then it used to be whole grain or whole grain rich, but the... Um, food nutrition guidelines were actually just lowered by the USDA. So now um, there's an unlimited amount of refined grains that can be on the menu, uh, strong push for flavored milk to be put back in schools. So an increase in sugar. I mean, this is where it starts to sound like a conspiracy, but here's what happened. Um, cons individual consumers stopped drinking as much milk. And so there is a glut of milk. The USDA has to get that milk to some buddy. It is low quality milk. And so they just add sugar and fat to it and put it in schools and say, hey, schools, now you don't have to follow the rules. You can serve this milk again. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's all bad. <laughs> it does sound like a, you know, a movie that you would go watch. It's fictional. And you're like, how could that possibly, that would never be yeah. true. But then you turn around and go, oh, that's our reality. Huh. It is a nightmare. It is a waking nightmare some days. And Just... you, wake, you wake up and it's still there. It's like, great. Yeah. So, yep. I mean, when you listen to all this and you're thinking, wow, here's the USA. I mean, I was in the military. I understand the government mm -hmm. is like, <laughs> on so many levels. There's so many issues. Um, so what can we do is, I mean... I, I believe that we have to build this from the ground up. Like you're pushing, you know, pushing the individual parents in their schools. Do you feel like there will be a tipping point at some point or where do you feel like what, what are the, the gains we have to make mm -hmm. to actually make the government stand up and go, well, I guess we're going to have to change our policies because yeah. <laughs> this um, is what's happening. I, I don't know what that point will be, just considering the amount of money we're up against in terms of agricultural lobby. But um, in the same way we can apply pressure to decision makers at local institutions, the government um, officials are in service to us. So they have a responsibility to their constituents. Uh, ostensibly, they have a responsibility to their constituents. Um, so in the same way we can organize around changing institutions locally, there is huge potential in organizing to change um, either local, state, or federal policy. Um, it's, it really is about, you know, mobile, like taking action on things, not just being like mad about them. Um, yeah, if you think about, you know, every town USA, right, mm -hmm. the um, 
uh, gun reform advocacy organization, you know, that was formed so that there was a way to take direct action. Balance is like that way to take direct action. Mm, absolutely. So it's interesting because you, when you say, you know, we, they're supposed to be <laughs> responsible for their constituents, but there are many of their constituents will belong to many of these lobbying groups, right? Sure. So it's more of a, a larger pressure. It's almost like a union <laughs> yeah. you know, pushing yeah. their, their strength. Because I went to Washington, D.C. and oh, when was this? I think it was early 2017. I mean, mm. it was somewhere maybe somewhere in there it was the winter of the 2016-17 with other physicians and we were lobbying for certain health reforms and all this other stuff and it's interesting because we had some um kind of like a group meeting uh, set up with local uh in dc with congressmen and one of them came up to you come to, up to a group of us and said i'm going to be very honest with you and i'll be the only one to tell you this the truth that the money that you spent on the airplane that you flew to DC um, to see us is what you should be, you know, donating to your congressman's campaign or whatever. And that's when you're going to have us listen to you. And I, um, I mean, it just, yeah. it just fires you up that, you know, you're here. It's a yes. privilege, just yeah. like it is a privilege for me to take care of someone. It's a privilege for you to be here representing us. Yeah. I think term, I think term limits are the key. <laughs> So yeah, if we get term limits with all of that and say, you know, they want to make, you know, in legacy building, let's, what is your legacy? Your legacy is that, oh, I got this much money and then I listen yeah. to you. And then yeah. uh, but if you have term limits, yeah. there's no, there's no incentive to necessarily have to listen to sure. the big lobbying groups or anything. So that I is think, my thought. But anyway, yeah, I think building off of that also is again, back to that being desensitized to disease. The talking points we use about health and nutrition and public health, uh, you know, it's the fact that 100 million Americans have prediabetes or diabetes, like that is such a massive number. One, it's inconceivable to actually conceptualize how many people that is. But that also means that potentially a lot of people don't see it as a problem. It's just like normal. And so right. having to convince people that, that these, you know, life altering diseases are actually problematic. The fact that that is part of the, the process we have to go through, mm -hmm. it just adds a whole nother complicating layer to this. Exactly, it's, it's discovered because they, you know, are representatives. They think that it's just normal that you get older, you have disease and you die yeah. of a heart attack. No, it's really right. not, it's really not. Also, it's really expensive. Like if you want more money to do stuff, you're yeah. we're spending 90% of our, uh, 90% of healthcare costs are for these diseases. Like, right. would, you, would you like 90% of $3.3 .3 trillion back? So let's work on that. that even that doesn't convince them. <laughs> because, you know, it's so hard to conceive even a million dollars, but yes. to conceive trillions of dollars. And then the thing is, they like, it can't be that simple. <laughs> it is that simple. Yes. And it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's people like you who are bringing that forward. And as things mobilize, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm seeing, you know, people becoming more interested yes. as the word, as social media has been such an empowering thing for the individual who wants to see change. That yes. that little bit of pressure point you said that just takes to make someone change is actually even a little, probably the bar is even lower because yep. they understand the, the, really the power of social media. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. That, to be used for good. I mean, it can be used for bad too, obviously. Yes. You know, there's, negative messages, um, you know, regarding the proper diet that confuse people. And oh God. Yeah. It's a whole nother level of frustration, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we, I have a feeling we could talk for a very long time about many of this. I love everything that you're doing and it's oh. such an incredible and an, um, amazing thing that someone would take on. And I love your enthusiasm and mm -hmm. your strategicness, right? It's not just go out and make a change. You're not just blasting a message, but you give right. the tools in a very logical manner. And you thought about every single component of what someone would need to be successful. So there's no excuses and the mm -hmm. obstacles have been removed. You've given them the, the roadmap. So yeah. at that <laughs> point, if they say no, it's really just, they don't want to. It's right? just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They don't want to, or they don't want to take the responsibility, but that's okay. Cause there'll be other people who will. And, yep. you know, I, I, I just say, you know, you share the message and those where the seed grows, it will, is meant to. And so it'll yeah. flourish. So is there any last message before we conclude here? But I know we definitely want I'll put in the notes, everyone, you know, balance.org and yeah. you know, how you can contact Audrey here. 
Um, what is the last message you'd like to share with the audience or encouragement or yeah. whatever you like? I mean, I think I mentioned this earlier, but do not underestimate your power. Um, in the same way that you are human, the people we're trying to convince and the systems we're trying to change are built by humans. And so um, human to human, you have a whole lot more power than you think you do. Um, human to system, not a lot of power, but <laughs> collectively we have the power to change systems. And so, um, yeah, get involved, just trust the process. It's ab absolutely going to work out. Absolutely. And in, in the, it can, that's all we can hope because it, yeah. it can't continue the way it is. It's unsustainable. So, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Ms. Audrey, thank for you. joining us and what a wonderful interview. And I, I hope everyone will take this to heart and at least, you know, browse your website and, you know, if they feel a pulling to, you know, listen to it, your gut's telling you for a reason. So I hope they, they take the challenge. So thank you. Yeah, thank you.